Hi, welcome to Tradition Today. I'm Father David Smith, the pastor of St. George's Orthodox Church in Utica, New York. And this is the fourth in our series on the seven ecumenical councils. We're looking at the seven ecumenical councils because in many ways they form the basis for Christianity. These were the gatherings of all the Christians in the world together. Not all the Christians, but all the bishops, the leadership of the churches in the world would gather together to answer the difficult questions that were being presented, the difficult questions that weren't so evident in the first century, in the time when the scriptures were being written, there were, these questions were not as evident because Christianity hadn't had time to sort of ripen, as it were, hadn't had time to develop controversies uh, among true believers, as it were. Uh, and so we look back to them uh, as authoritative, as teaching us about what is important about God. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary? Who, uh, and, and should we have icons in the church? and other questions like that. These were the questions asked by the seven ecumenical councils, and the decisions they made, guided by the Holy Spirit, should guide the church even today. I think it's important for us to understand that there are times when we will change things in the church, but we need to, as uh, G.K. Chesterton said, we need to give our ancestors a vote. We need to not simply say, well, we're obviously smarter and we're better and we're faster than those people were back then, and so we understand things more and we're going to change the direction of the church to fit what we want. Well, you know, that's all well and good, except that it's important for us to understand what did those people think in past years? Why did they make the decisions they did? What was the data they were working with, and how is it different? Are we really more holy than they were? Are we really more intelligent than they were? Simply because we have radar and cell phones does that mean we're better able to make decisions as to the future of the church? So we, we go back to the seven ecumenical councils. The Orthodox Church is known as the Church of the Councils because we retain many of the traditions that were introduced at these councils or that were rather hmm, solidified at the councils because the councils really didn't meet in order to change the direction of the church. What they wanted to do was find out what was believed by all Christians for all time. So they wanted to find out, well, what, what would Jesus want us to believe? What did the apostles have in mind when they started the church? What did the, the, the disciples of the apostles have in mind when they took over and so on and so forth? So they, they looked back and they said, we want to understand what is right, what the Holy Spirit has, has told the church from the beginning and continues to tell the church. Now, because of this uh, emphasis on, on trying to decide between two points of view, we'll find that very often when we're studying the ecumenical councils, we're studying heresy. We're studying heretics because it came to be uh, this is uh, so often the case that there were two points of view presented, and then when the church would gather together to say, okay, let's figure out which point of view is correct. When they sat down to try to figure that out and decided on one particular point of view as, as the canonical teaching of the church, it very often happened that the other side uh, would not repent would not change their mind, would not say, yes, this is what the Holy Spirit is teaching the church. It was very often a peaceful and collegial 
process that occurred, uh, with some notable exceptions, but it was very often a peaceful and collegial process, and yet, and yet very often heretics did not turn from their ways. And this is why even till today we have uh, 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 churches that are like the Jacobite churches. These are churches that split away from the church very early over the ecumenical councils and have uh, never returned to the never returned to the fold. Um, so we're studying heretics. And in a way, when I, when I talk about this to people, I like to say it's a little bit like when you take your car to get fixed. If the mechanic just comes out and says to you that you have a great car and it real works well and you have good radio stations on your radio and the tires are good, if he tells you everything except or talks about everything except what is really the, the issue, why did you bring it there in the first place? then it's a waste of time. What you need to do is address those places where it's going wrong. And in the seven ecumenical councils, we are very often addressing those places where it went wrong. We finished up last time with the end of the life of Arius, the patriarch of Alexandria, uh, or Bishop of Alexandria. Ar Arius was one of the first long-lived, influential heretics of the church. He was not an outsider that came in and attacked the church from the outside, but he was an insider. He was schooled in Antioch. He was the bishop of uh, Alexandria, and he influenced many, many people, including Constantine the Emperor, Constantine the Great himself was influenced by Arius and often spoke to Arius. And so this was a, this was a, a heresy that involved the entire church, his heresy that Jesus was a creation of the Father and not co-eternal with the Father. Well, having come to the end of uh, Arius's life, we then move on and uh, uh, as, as is often the case with history, someone else comes along to cause trouble and we'll begin to look at him uh, in this program. Now, I'm going to be reading from a uh, lecture I delivered uh, at a university, a university um, history class asked me to come in and talk about the seven ecumenical councils one time, uh, but I'll be adding my own commentary to it as we go along. Our next great heretic is Nestorius the Bishop of Constantinople in the first half of the fifth century. So already we're into the, into the 400s, 400 years after the birth of Christ. When he ascended to his bishopric, he found himself in the middle of a debate concerning the term Theotokos. This is what the Orthodox uh, this is the name the Orthodox uh, use for Mary, the Virgin Mary. This title came to be used for Mary, the mother of Jesus, in order to preserve the doctrine that Jesus Christ was indeed divine from birth. It comes from the Greek theos, meaning God, and tokos, meaning bearer. We have this word in the English language, by the way, in the word take. When you take something, you pick it up and you carry it away. Well, that word was in Greek as well, tokos, and theotokos means the carrier of God, the one who gave birth, uh, carried God in her womb. Accurately translated, it means God birth giver, though many today translate it simply as the mother of God. Now, it would seem illogical to say that God experienced birth. And so it seems impious to use this term, as, as some have argued with me even recently. Yes, indeed, recently I, I used the word theotokos when I was speaking with someone, and they said, theotokos, I've never heard that word, what does that mean? And I said, oh, it means the mother of God. And this particular person, who's not Orthodox, but a Christian, said, uh, I didn't realize God had a mother. And I said to that person, well, do you believe that Jesus is God? 
Well, yes, he said, of course. Well, then I said, Jesus had a mother. So the term Theotokos, while we're not going to say the eternal God, the Father, had a mother who existed before him, yet we are going to say that Jesus, 100% God and 100% man, did have a mother on this earth. However, we also have to understand that the theological tension we wish to preserve is that Jesus was and is God, yet also fully man. The tension is preserved in this word because if we're rejecting this title for Mary, we must say one of two things, either that Jesus is not God or that Mary is not Jesus' mother. If we can deny either one of those things, then the term Theotokos is an appropriate title for Mary. You're not saying as much about Mary as you are about Jesus. She was the birth giver of God. That's saying that Jesus is God. Now, of course, as soon as you say that about somebody, the birth giver of God, you do indeed say something about that person as well. And of course, we cannot deny either statement, either of those statements, if we hold the Bible to be the Word of God, which we do. Nestorius would not have agreed with me. He said that neither the term nor the idea was found in Scripture. And indeed, in a way, that's true. And so he tried to get the, the church to use the term Christotokos, or even more obtusely, to use Theotokos only when anthropotokos, meaning man birth giver, was used at the same time. So here's what Nestorius said. Stop using the term Theotokos. You can call him Christotokos, or you can call her Christotokos, or you can call her Theotokos anthropotokos. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty big word. I don't think we would call anybody that. Nestorius was not a great theologian, nor a great word inventor, by the way, and the church basically opposed him, setting a precedent that was present before that time, but was unrealized in its fullness. That is, in the Orthodox Church, the Holy Spirit rests with the people. The Holy Spirit is not given to the leadership of the church and then filtered down to the people, but the Holy Spirit rests on every single person in the Orthodox Church. The hierarchy of the church does not tell the people what to do, but they provide spiritual leadership while the people defend the faith using tradition as a guide. This was the most evident in the Nestorian controversy, in when Nestorius was saying that you could not use the term Theotokos. And as well we can imagine, when people began to use this term, when they began to look at the Mother of God, at the Theotokos, at the Virgin Mary, with the kind of love and devotion that that term would inspire, and then suddenly to have the patriarch come along and say, no, you can't do that anymore. Well, he got a lot of opposition, especially from older people, especially from the women. Again, recall the Council of Jerusalem. The leader of the church, St. James of Jerusalem, made his decision, and it was his decision to make. This is the one I talked about in the first segment of the series based on the sense that the Holy Spirit gave the people in the course of the debate. So in other words, an ecumenical council meets together and they decide not what is right, what is good, what is proper, what is fair. They decide what is it that the Holy Spirit is telling us is true. Nestorius was different. Here you have a hierarch imposing his beliefs on the people. And in this case, the people simply would not listen. The third council held in Ephesus in 431. Remember, the first two ecumenical councils were basically concerned with Arius. Now we come to the third ecumenical council, 431, held in Ephesus, the, the, the sort of ancient Christian city. 
condemned Nestorius and established for all time that Mary would be referred to as Theotokos by the Orthodox. It also, incidentally, decreed that the Nicene Creed could never be altered, something that the Church of Rome unilaterally did some years later. But the Nestorian heresy sparked more controversy over the person of Christ and over the ways in which his two natures, the divine and the human, were related. This controversy was called the monophysite debate. Now, now we get into we get into parts of early church history that are that are very confusing to us because it doesn't seem to us like it's that important a thing. And if we look back, especially in the Monophysite heresy and the Monophysite debate, it went on for years and years and years in the church. You had Monophysite churches right next to Orthodox churches, Monophysite bishops next to Orthodox bishops, and so on and so forth. And they, ha they hung on for many, many Many years, and they, and the Monophysites uh, had martyrs for their own faith. You know that the that had been killed in various skirmishes and so on and so forth. But first, let me describe what that word Monophysite means. This word is made up of mono, meaning one, and physite, meaning nature. One nature. That's the meaning of that word. The debate came out of the Fourth Ecumenical Council which upheld the canons of the third by describing Jesus Christ as having two natures, two separate natures, a divine and a human. I've said this before on uh, Tradition Today, and I'll say it again. Jesus was the only 200% man. He was 100% man, 100% God. There was two natures in him, two, two, two parts, if you will. The Fourth Council, held in Chalcedon in 451, 20 years after the Third, made the statement that Christ's person held two natures, without confusion, change, division, or separation. So he's the 200% man, something that we can't understand. We can't understand how somebody can be 100% God and 100% man. It doesn't make any sense to us. There's a lot of parts about Christianity, about the cross, about the resurrection, about our Lord that don't make intellectual sense to us. They're just revealed to us as truth. Those who embraced the monophysite position, who rejected this two-nature idea, they didn't want two natures. They wanted one. They said, no, Christ can't have two natures. No one can. He has one claimed then and claim today that they have no difference whatsoever with the traditions of the church father, but that their theology simply expresses better the true nature of Christ. So even today, Monophysites will argue that essentially there's no difference in the teaching, but that they explain Christ's nature better by saying that he has only one. Many peaceful and genuine attempts at reunion were made and have been made and are being made, but uh, so far have been unsuccessful. They continually continue literally until today. The churches that separated from the Orthodox Church in the fifth century were the Coptic Church, the Ethiopian Church, the Armenian Church, and several others. These churches still exist today, and they still contribute a lot to the world and to the under, you know, to Christianity in the world. A joint issue, a joint statement was issued four years ago, stating that members of these churches—they're called the non-Chalcedonian churches because they rejected the Council of Chalcedon could receive the sacraments of the Orthodox Church, although our clergy cannot serve together at the same altar. This gave me, personally, the wonderful opportunity to do many Ethiopian and Eritrean baptisms and a wedding while I served at a church in Canada. So the Monophysites, the, the understanding for some people is that the Monophysites um, differ from the Orthodox only in terms of language. And either way, it is, it is the accepted teaching of both churches that if there is no Monophysite church available in a particular place, those people can partake of the sacraments of the uh, Orthodox Church. And this was why I had the opportunity to uh, get to know I had a number of Ethiopians' uh, families in my parish. 
I can't go into the theological debate that rages behind our continued separation just now, and it, it is a, a thick theological debate, because I want to move on to the next great empire-rocking controversy that came from the church, which is the iconoclastic controversy. For this, we have to skip the fifth and the sixth councils, but I'll tell you the one canon that I'm personally thankful for that came from these councils was the decision that discontinued obligatory celibacy for the clergy. I myself have a wife and four children, and indeed, uh, if the uh, fifth and sixth ecumenical councils had not met together and discontinued obligatory uh, celibacy, uh, I probably wouldn't be saying that to you, and my kids wouldn't exist even today. So we were going, we're going to get into the seventh ecumenical councils. Uh, the fifth and sixth ecumenical councils, in a way, just sort of took care of, of uh, issues that had come up that weren't as weren't as sort of widespread or controversy causing as the issues that we're looking at, like the monophysite debate, like iconoclasm and so on. Uh, but they did take care of important things in the church, which we look at today in terms of how we take communion and so on and so forth. Uh, so I don't like skipping over them, but in terms of something that's really interesting in history and something that informs the church even today, it's the iconoclastic debate uh, culminating in the Seventh Ecumenical Council, and even, of course, the, the controversy continued after it, uh, which we'll begin looking at in the next uh, segment of tradition today. And now it's my prayer that as we look at the seven ecumenical councils and look at the traditions of ancient Christianity that have been given down to us, that we would use them and thank God for them as we try to know him more and serve him better. St. Tikhon's has always been uh, one of the centers of the church. We have different kind of services that we offer, uh, not only through the liturgy, like we say that they celebrate every day, but also through the work at the seminary that the monks have been doing since the inception of the seminary in 1938, when it was founded by Archbishop Arseni, the, the builder of the monastery. Also, the monks uh, also travel. Some of them do uh, give lectures and, and give retreats. Uh, for many years, I traveled with the mission choir raising funds for the seminary. Um, also, the monks are involved in um, different work of, of, of uh, kind of upkeep, keeping uh, our repositories and our museums uh, clean and uh, making sure that the icons are in good shape and that uh, we're kind of caretakers of all the treasures that St. Tikhon's has. There's so many different um, kind of cultural and historical monuments that we house here at the, at the monastery. Um, that work is, is, is very difficult sometimes just to kind of the upkeep of the property. We have almost 300 acres. Um, it's not exclusively the monasteries, but uh, it's shared by the monastery and the seminary. So the upkeep of a couple hundred acres of um, land is, is very difficult in all the things that are housed um, thereon. Uh, monasticism uh, in general for the Orthodox Church is, is uh, at the forefront of the spiritual battle. Uh, it's the, uh, the front runner. Of, of the spiritual life in the church, it kind of plows the way for the rest of uh, the people, the laity and the priests doing the work. The monastics are, are doing the battle on the spiritual level, uh, whereas sometimes the, the priests and the uh, laity do more of the, the physical uh, battling for the kingdom where they set up churches, uh, whereas a monk, uh, his, his entire work is, is consecrated to prayer. And it's through the prayers of the saints and through the monastics who offer um, their life and sacrifice to the Lord uh, that the Lord uh, bestows his benediction and his blessing upon the work that is done by everybody else. So really, uh, monasticism here is, is exemplified uh, through the liturgical life that we have here and through the daily life of prayer that each monastic uh, 
as in his own cell. Uh, the, the, the liturgy has been celebrated here almost daily since 1905, so for almost 105 years. Uh, the liturgy has been offered up and it, and it becomes a, really source, a real source of power. There's, there's such a kind of forward movement of strong, powerful spiritual energy that's, that's uh, uh, blessing and, and benefiting um, all America. Uh, this kind of power and strength that comes from the prayers here uh, is incalculable and it's inestimable. Uh, the, the value of it is hard to, to understand. Uh, but really when, when we uh, begin to understand it, we begin to uh, really kind of tap into the mystery of, of the spiritual world, which is, is present among us, but the uh, effects often are not uh, always seen immediately. More recently, we've been uh, involved in work with a candle factory. We have our own candles now that we're offering uh, hand-dipped 100% beeswax candles that we're offering for the, the church in America to use um, for, for, for worship. Those are available at the bookstore. Uh, well, St. Tikhon's, we have our own hives, so we produce uh, quite a bit of honey. A monastery is often kind of akin to a, a hive, you know, because it's there's always so much activity. So usually when when we see uh, maybe um, different bees kind of gathering, just kind of spontaneously creating a hive at a monastery, uh, which has happened, um, I've seen before at, at uh, different monasteries, uh, it's, a, it's a very good sign. It's a sign of God's blessing upon uh, uh, the monastery. Uh, because of course bees are, are such hard workers and also there's a, a sweetness there that comes from their work that, that we partake of. We've also been doing more work in the bookstore lately with uh, getting some of the publications back um, on the shelves, um, doing some different writings, um, eventually going to be publishing some, some more work, some new work, some much needed work in the area of translation and anthologies. We publish CDs. Uh, we're in the middle of, of doing different kind of music projects right now with the Orthodox two-part music. Um, there's a website that's available, orthodox2partmusic.org. Um, and all of the CDs that go along with that, we're in process with that. Uh, so the, the activities of the monastery are, are varied and there's many of them that go on. We also have a parish here. The parish has been here since the monastery has been here. So we have parishioners, uh, we have different hierarchical uh, events that happen here, whether it's the Holy Synod meetings occasionally or um, different conferences that the seminary and monastery either puts on or supports or, or helps with. Uh, so the work here is great and uh, the need is great as well for, for people to, to come to help uh, not only with their hands but also through their prayers, uh, through their donations and uh, through people actually coming and, and, and uh, living here and giving their lives here as, as monastics and uh, teachers and workmen in the Lord's Vineyard at St. Tikhon's. We recently remodeled um, some of our houses to en enable us to house visitors. These uh, guest houses are, are open to the general public. Everybody is welcome to come uh, to the monastery to visit for several days if they wish. Um, they just have to contact us by phone uh, or by email and we are open to um, their visit and we would be glad to have uh, anybody uh, come to visit with us and stay with us and to uh, find uh, a, a greater closeness to the Lord and to really experience the monastery as, as it is uh, on the inside. Um, and it's important for, for everybody in the church in America to know that uh, this place is their home. You know, this place is theirs. It's not just the monks, it's, it's our monastery, the Orthodox, uh, all of the faithful uh, in the American Orthodox Church. It's, it's our monastery and it's a place where all of us can come to, to stay, to pray, and to be uh, renewed. And so these guest houses are, are precisely um, our invitation to the general public, uh, especially the Orthodox faithful, to, to come to visit with us, to come to receive um, traditional monastic hospitality, and, and to know that uh, there is a place for them, uh, that they are welcome uh, at the monastery, uh, that the door is always open, that there's always food on the table, and that all are, are welcome to come to be with us and to uh, experience um, our Lord Jesus Christ in, 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 the, in His church.